Hello friends, uh, in the previous lecture we have discussed about the hot deformation processes uh, which are conventional, which are uh, now right now used in industry heavily. And the, in today's lecture we will be discussing about the uh, different type of hot deformation processes which, which are non-conventional. Okay. And uh, if I want to divide or uh, classify these two conventional and non-conventional uh, on the basis of their deformation, uh, uh, how we are deforming the material, I would also segregate it into uh, the compression and the shear based. Okay. Most, most of the, these new non-conventional processes are uh, based on the shear deformation, okay. shear type of strain is, uh, is imposed. And the main idea behind designing these new processes is to impose, to impose a strain without changing the, the dimension of the material or without changing the cross sectional area of the material. As you can see in, in all the no conventional processes, whether you take a rolling or forging or extrusion, okay, when you impose the strain, there is a change in the uh, cross sectional area of the material. Okay. So, these new processes are basically also trying to achieve a goal that you do not change the, uh, the shape of the material or the cross sectional area of the material and still you should be able to impose the strain. And that is why these are all shear based uh, uh, processes. Okay. One of them may not be shear based, okay. but uh, uh, I will let you know which one is that. Okay. So, for first and uh, very uh, popular or very common process where people want to impose lot of strain in the material. Okay, is called equal channel angular pressing. Okay, as you can see again, the the idea of not changing the cross sectional area can be seen here because, uh, as the name suggests, it is equal channel. So channel uh, size has to be equal. Okay, so you can see there is a plunger here. Okay, a plunger is here, and your sample block in the uh, in a uh, it is like a cuboid. Okay, and uh, you have the same size of cavity in the die. Okay. So, you put the material and force the material to go through the die okay. and then the material will flow like this in this direction okay. and will come out uh, of the opening here. And as you can see because we have kept the whole size of the channel same. Okay the same size of the block will be coming out of that. Okay. But because of this change in the angle or change in the direction of the movement of the sample, you have imposed lot of shear strain in the material okay. and that is how you are going to uh, refine or break the dendritic structure. All those things you can do in this without changing the size of the material. Okay. Because when you change the size, you have a limit of uh, imposing the amount of strain okay, and how lower you can get because as you keep putting strain the thickness of the material keep reducing. Okay. Here there is no reduction in the thickness of the material. If you see in more detail that how the die will be there. Okay. So, you have different angles shown here okay, to design the die that what will be the angle shy here what will be the angle phi here. So, you can take different uh, uh, angles for these and depending upon this angle uh, that will decide what amount of strain you are putting in. Okay. So, the initial uh, one element in the block is shown by A, B, C, D here okay, uh, a rectangle okay. and when it goes through this angle. So, you have maximum shear strain imposed somewhere here. Okay, at 45 uh, depending upon what angles you are taking and now this a b c d this rectangle has become a prime b prime c prime d prime parallelogram. Okay. So, this shape has become this So and the change in the shape is because of the strain shear strain which you have put. So, basically if you have some block and if I put the shear strain okay, the block which is something like this let us say. I have fixed it at one end 
I am applying a shear stress on the top part. Okay, so, how, what it will become? It will become something like this and the amount of strain can be you can get from how much is the displacement divided by the height. Okay, so, let us say displacement is A then A by H will give you the amount of shear strain which you have introduced in the material. Okay, so, similar thing you can see here. Now, you can also see a very nice uh, uh, micrograph here. So, uh, this, uh, this is uh, the I think x, y, z directions are shown here okay, and they are also showing the grain structure in the different planes. Okay. So, you can see that how the material has flown in this particular cross section, okay. the material flow direction is like this, okay. the grains are stacked in this direction, okay. in this direction the grains are elongated in this direction, similarly I think in this direction. Okay, so, the shear strain is I think seen by this particular plane and they are also trying to show you what is the effect of this uh, kind of deformation process. Okay. So, this curve 1 is the initial coarse grain material okay. and then uh, it was cold rolled to 60 percent okay. and that is the effect of that you can see here. So, you can see the, the increase in strength can be due to fine grain microstructure okay, because the increase in the dislocation density okay, and um, uh, maybe some uh, uh, precipitates of course, will not be a problem here. So, basically the increase in strength uh, can be of because of two reasons refinement or breaking of the grain okay, and increase in the dislocation density there are instead of cold rolling you can do this e cap process. So, 2 passes is introduced and 16 passes are introduced. Okay. So, 2 passes again you can see that the strength has increased and in 16 passes again the strength has increased and also there is a good amount of ductility in the material. Okay. Of course, there must be some microstructural changes which we do not know, but if you go to paper here you will be able to get all the details that why the strength and ductility both has improved. Okay. But the idea here is that from coarse grain if you keep refining, if you keep putting a strain in the material there is an increase in strength and sometimes there is uh, also increase in ductility with the strength. Another very uh, important uh, this type of technique uh, non-conventional. Uh, or deformation processes uh, is called accumulative roll bonding. Okay. So, in accumulative roll bonding, okay, the roll material what you do is it is a simple rolling process only. So, this is one of the conventional process modified as a non-conventional one. Okay. So, again what you do you roll a sheet, okay, its cross sectional area will be reduced. Let us say it is becoming half, the thickness is becoming half after rolling from the initial thickness. Okay. So, there is an initial thickness and now it is becoming let us say half. Okay. So, this T 1 let us say this is T 2. So, T 1 is equal half of T 2. Okay. So, what you do once you have this T 2 thickness, okay, now you cut it and again fold it. Okay. So, you put it one over another. Okay. So, now again it has become T 2 and again you will be rolling it and making it T 1. Okay. Again you will do the stacking. So, accumulatively you are doing this rolling okay. and at the same time because of the deformation okay, when you are putting the deformation and all these are done at high temperature also. There is also a bonding between the a metallurgical bonding between the two sheets. Okay. So, this is cut the surface to be joined are roughened and cleaned. Of course, you have to do all this because if there is any oil. Okay, then there would not be a good contact. Okay. So, you have to make a increase the surface area by, by doing some roughening process or by doing some what uh, by some, uh, some kind of embry paper or maybe silicon carbide paper okay. and again you stake it, heat it, again you roll it. Okay. So, uh, if you see here by 
this on the x axis in this graph you are seeing layers 10 layers, 20 layers, 30 layers. So, that many times layers are stacked and uh, are allowed to roll go through the rolling process. Okay. So, that much amount of strain is there okay. and uh, the yield strength is plotted here okay, as a function of these layers. Okay. So, you can see that the yield strength is increasing from around 200 mega Pascal and going up to maybe around 600 mega Pascal okay. and similarly tensile strength is also increasing from around 300 mega Pascal and going up to around 800 mega Pascal. But your ductility is reducing somewhere from uh, it can it could reach 80 percent uh, elongation now it has reduced up to maybe around 5 percent or so. Okay. So, the increase in the strength is at the cost of decrease in the ductility. In the earlier slide we saw in E cap of course, they might have done some uh, nice fancy things there. Okay. The, there was also with the strain there was a increase in the ductility, but here the ductility has reduced with the uh, 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 though the strength has increased. You can see in this micrograph that how accumulated roll bonding layers are seen. Okay. So, you can see that all these black lines here, these are the interfaces where staking was done. Okay. So, when you do the staking there has to there will always a interface will be formed. Okay. So, this is the initial layer okay. and then you are staking it. So, you will also see the if uh, the effect of the interface. So, all these are interfaces here. Okay. So, so, individual layer they are saying that it is around 76.5 micron thick okay. and because of this interface which you form actually you would not get very good ductility in this material because this interface will give away the, the material will separate out and then you would not reach the uh, deformation which you want. Okay. Another very uh, lot of uh, literature is there in the in the uh, in journals, okay. And this is called a high pressure torsion (HPT). Okay. Uh, the drawback here is that the sample size which you take is very small, okay. And the process is like this: so you have a die here, okay, lower die, and then there is an upper die which is putting a normal force here. Okay. And at the same time you are also rotating it, you are rotating the die. Okay. So, what you are doing is at very high this normal load and you are forcing the material to also rotate. Okay. So, you are introducing lot of shear deformation because of this, uh, this kind of churning. Okay. So, you can uh, understand it like that you take a wet cloth and you want to take water out what you do is you kind kind of put a torsion kind of uh, uh, deformation okay so this is the similar one here and again uh, there are a uh, lot of effect of these uh, kind of straining okay so you can see number of revolutions are shown on the x axis here two revolutions has gone or three revolution four up to 10 they have gone and they have also plotted what is the equivalent strain which you are putting in the material okay that is also of course going up okay so and this is a different radius okay so you can understand that when you do a torsion experiment okay the strain will increase as a function of radius from the center okay at the at the further furthest point you will have maximum strain so you can see the strain at the furthest point is increasing in this direction and at the same time because you are putting more number of revolution the strain is increasing in this direction also. Okay. So, with the number of cycles and at what distance you are measuring the strain both will be important. So, again as you can see in earlier conventional ones we saw that the strain is there is a strain distribution in the material similarly here you will have large number of strain distribution and effect of that also can be seen on the hardness value. So, these are a hardness value shown here in giga Pascal and this distance from the center in mm. Okay. So, you can see where the strain is minimum 
okay the the hardness is also minimum and as you go away from the center the hardness in the material is increasing because strain is more as you can see in the first graph and if you this is for one turn if you put more turns of course the hardness will increase okay and also there will be again another variation from center to the edge you can see the variation in the hardness from edge to uh, center region here also okay that at edge region the hardness is going like this so this is at edge region and this is at center okay variation in the strain and you can see effect on the strength another one uh, again taken from conventional processes forging okay modified for non conventional process okay so basically the idea is that you start with a uh, a block like this which has a higher uh, length in one direction and you forge it okay so what it will do it will flow in this direction when you are forging like this and the, now you will have a higher length in in one of this direction okay and it will be because you are you have a constant volume processes in during plastic deformation volume constancy is there okay the reduction in the other two sides will be again will look, the block will look similar to this so you change the you rotate it again you kind of forge it again it will get this shape you rotate it put it here again you put it uh, forge it and you get a this shape so in these three steps okay you get the same material as you have started with okay and uh, the amount of strain which you are putting in and in this uh, in each of this stage you can uh, if you are calculating uh, true strain you can just do an addition and find out what is the maximum strain you have uh, imparted okay and uh, also you can see the effect of that in the mechanical properties okay so as you can see here uh, this is the original material it has this uh, strength okay uh, around 300 mega pascal uts and uh, ductility of about you can say 32% okay so this is after three passes means three stages as we have just seen okay then this is after six passes and this is after nine passes okay so you can see that effect of passes means effect of strain you can see in increasing the strength of the material okay and also this is these are the microstructure at different stages so this is the initial microstructure okay and um, this is after the first uh, pass this is after the uh, so this is after uh, in, in in this three passes okay this is after six passes and this is after nine passes okay which are shown here and you can see that how the microstructure refinement is taking place because of this kind of deformation so you started with a very coarse grain material so the scale is here it shows 100 micron so i can take a intelligent guess here and maybe the grain size here must be around uh, let's say 40 30 40 micron okay and this is the first uh, part of the deformation another part of the deformation and of course you can also see there is a change in the scale here and here it is only showing as 50 micron okay and you can see the microstructure has refined a lot okay so because of the deformation there is a microstructural refinement also there will be large amount of dislocation density will be there and effect of the, these two you can see on the strength of the material again you can see here that it is uh, at the cost of ductility so elongation has come down from 32% to around 10% another very uh, 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 one important process uh, which is gaining lot of attention uh, nowadays is called friction stir processing okay uh, so friction stir processing uh, you can see as noted here is uh, actually the process has started as a welding process so if you take two sheets you can do welding using this particular process but now it is also modified to uh, made it, made it as a processing technique okay so it is a derivative of friction stir welding technique and this a rotating tool consists of a shoulder and a 
pin concentric pin is inserted in the material. Friction between surface of the sample and the shoulder generates heat which results uh, in softening of the material and the inserted pin stir the material around it. So, I will show you the my, uh, photograph or schematic of this to um, clarify you this particular process in more detail. Okay. So, as you can see this these are two sheets there is a joint here. Okay. So, what you are doing so this is actually right now in a welding condition. Okay. So, what you are doing is you have a tool which is rotating okay, and you are also applying a normal load here okay, along this direction and there is a rotation. This shoulder surface if I want to see from this side okay, if I do not want to see in perspective it, it will look something like this. Let me change the color here. So, the shoulder and pin if I want to show the shoulder will be just touching the surface of the work piece and the pin is going inside the work piece okay. and now it is also rotating okay. and there is a normal load. Okay. So, what you are doing is this, this friction between the surface and the work piece surface uh, shoulder surface and work piece surface is generating heat very high heat and because of that the material around this region is getting soft because of the temperature and this rotating pin is now stirring the material around it. Okay. So, you can understand this process as a what you do in a mixi okay, or in a mixer okay. you are rotating whatever is kept inside the uh, container. Okay. So, here also you have a rotation of the material around the pin. So, this, this uh, both the thermal and mechanical processes are combined here and because of that you actually do if it is a welding process you do the welding okay. and if it is a if, if it is a monolithic material then you do can consider it as a processing. Okay. So, in the stir zone if you see Okay, so, they, they have shown a stir zone then a, you can call a, a zone which is called a thermomechanically affected zone then heat affected zone and unaffected zone. Okay, so, in this what we call as nuggets here okay, or also I some sometimes some people call it as a stir zone or nugget zone because of this deformation this shear deformation. Okay. Uh, the grain size gets refined and also you get better properties because of the reduction in the grain size. This is an actual image of friction stir processing. Okay. So, you can if you have in your place any milling machine you can easily modify that milling machine to do this kind of process. So, in that way it is a very simple process and with the existing equipment you can uh, use that equipment to do this kind of welding or processing and that is why they, it is a, it is very popular because existing equipment can be used. Okay. So, there is there is a good amount of grain refinement when you do this process okay. as you can see here uh, this is a annealed uh, 5086 uh, aluminum alloy. Okay and the grain size is around 50 micron okay, as you can see here very nice uh, grain. Again this is a colored map which shows orientation and these type of maps are called uh, EBSD maps or EBSD is for electron back scattered diffraction okay, EBSD which gives you orientation information. Okay. So, and now depending upon how you are rotating at what rate okay, and how you are moving the tool. Okay. So, these two parameters if you control okay, as is controlled here and here okay, you can see that you can do a variety of refinements. Okay. So, at one particular processing condition you have reached uh, grain size of 12 micron from 50. Okay. In another processing condition at lower rpm and higher traverse speed you have reached another grain size which is 7.4 micron from 50 micron. Okay. So, very good control over microstructure you can achieve in this type of uh, processing. Okay. 
So, these are the different processes which are which you can uh, 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 combine into a, a non conventional processes ok and most of these processes are shear based uh, processes that means, you are imposing the strain under shear condition. Also you can see that the idea here is that you should not change the cross sectional area or the overall shape of the material and still you should be able to impose a strain in the material ok. So, combining this you and these are only few of the non conventional processes we I have covered here in the given time ok. If you go look at the literature there are even larger number of processes which on which people are working ok. So, it will be an interesting exercise for you also to look for these processes ok. So, the what are these non conventional processes and in fact, if you like you can design your own process also which is not till now anybody has thought of like this one friction stress processing very nice technique to do welding as well as processing ok. So, with this uh, I would uh, say thank you for uh, watching this lecture.